again, not as efficient. Um, the great thing about, again, so some of your newer DJI drones, even like your Band 4 Pros, uh, you know, great flight time, quoted at 28 minutes or something, probably more like 25 minutes real world. It's still lots, you know, lots better than what we had a couple of years ago. Um, the Inspire is a great option as well, only flies about that 12 to 15. Um, but good optics inside. We're going to have a bit of a look at how the Inspire actually works with, with mapping today. A couple of main um, apps that are on the market. Now, DJI has released a newer app that allows you to construct a survey group, um, which is a new um, system on your, your Mavics will do it, your Phantom 4s will do it, Phantom 3s can't do it, or Inspire, but Inspire 2 can. Uh, there's some other third party apps, so you've got Drone Deploy, um, which you might have heard of, um, it's also Maps Made Easy. A couple of others. I use Maps Made Easy generally because it allows us to actually take control a little bit more of some of the key parameters with the camera. Um, what you find is that if you're flying, you know, perhaps on an overcast day or days where there's not a lot of light, you might need to actually adjust your shutter. They so allow a little bit more light in. The risk with that is if you adjust that shutter too far, it stays open for too long, you're flying along taking photos as you fly, so you get blurring the image. Which when we're looking to reconstruct a 3D model is an ideal. That's going to mess up with the accuracy. So that uh, the good thing about Maps Made Easy is it allows you to adjust that shutter speed, which I find that if you set things on auto, sometimes the RPA will set that shutter too long, and so then you end up with this imagery that isn't that great. So something to be aware of. Drone Deploy may have updated that. I haven't used it for probably six months. So have a look. Um, you can jump on the websites and have a look. Maps Made Easy is free for the app. Um, it's about twelve or fifteen dollars for a more advanced version, and uh, they may have made it twelve or fifteen for the standard now. Drone Deploy is free for the app pay for the processing. So upload all your data posts, your images, they come up with the model and you can export that then. Um, something we also find which is really great is uh, the propeller platform which we'll show you back in the classroom. Um, so those guys have developed a, a really comprehensive survey and inspection platform that you can then share with the clients. Um, and they allow you to do a lot more survey specific measuring than some of the other platforms like Drone Deploy um, or Maps Made Easy and others. So we'll go through that in class together and have a look at some of those capabilities. When we're looking at doing the survey itself, I'll show you the app Maps Made Easy. Essentially what's going to happen is we're going to set an area, okay, which would be the survey area. I encourage you, if you are surveying an area, always set a little bit further outside of the, the data that you need to collect, okay, because obviously this thing's going to be most accurate where we have the most images overlapping each other. So if you set your boundary right on the boundary of the actual data set you want, you're not going to have as many overlapping images past that point. So always go a little bit wider than what you need to. Be aware of roads and things like that. Is it a problem to fly over a road if there's no one on the road? No. No, that's okay. If there's a car underneath you, what do you think? No. Can't fly. Well, yeah. Or, so or avoid the it. The risk would be, technically, you're saying, are you a risk or a hazard, okay, to the car, to the person really inside that car? Could cause an accident, um, possibly within that 30 metres. So whilst the 30 metres doesn't apply necessarily to vehicles that are, you know, don't have someone in them, uh, if you've got someone driving on the road and you're within 30 metres and there's a possible collision risk and hazard, then you're probably obviously not in the green, so be aware of that. For that reason, I'll always plan um, these routes so that I'm going parallel to a road, so that the RPA doesn't swing over past it to come back onto the grid. So line up with the side of your roads where you can. Um, if you need to plan separate grids, then do that to make that happen, because it will always shoot generally about 20 metres past the end of your box to try and fly back across. Obviously considerations here. Here's a bit more control. We know that there's not anyone coming through here, but obviously yeah, you've got a public road out here down to the south, so I'll line up at the side of that, just something to be aware of. Overlap is something that you need to think of as well. So the more overlap we have, the more um, ground we're gonna have replicated in each shot, which allows you to get a higher accuracy. I would generally run minimum around 75, 75 for survey, okay? So you can do less than that, but you will find sometimes that your accuracy will decrease in points. Um, some people say go 70, 70. Look, realistically, you can stitch together a map that looks right, probably 55, 60% overlap if you need. But if you're looking for volumetric data where you want to get accurate vertical data, I wouldn't go below 75. If you want to go next step, probably go 80, 75. Some people fly 85, 80. When I say the two numbers, all I'm saying is basically vertical overlap versus horizontal overlap. Okay, so that's how much we're getting in each image. Uh, this sort of system, we'll run at 75, 75 for an example. The other key consideration is height. Now, when we fly higher, naturally the ground is further away. What that means is that our camera will have a certain amount of pixels that are available for us to actually gather information. As we fly higher, that means that the distance of the ground in each of those pixels is greater. Okay, so it's less detail. It's common sense in that sense. So the higher you fly, 
the more ground you're going to cover, which means you'll need to fly less flight lines, which is a win for time, but the downside is that you're not going to be as accurate, okay? So the sweet spot is around one and a half to two centimetres per pixel is what we call it. So that's how much ground is per pixel in the shot. Um, you find that, in terms of what we're actually talking about, the ground per pixel, it's called the ground sample distance. You might have seen that around for GSD. Did you ever see that? that's what that's referring to? So one and a half GSD is 1.5 centimetres of ground per pixel on the camera. The sweet spot is around one and a half too because um, out of the research that has been conducted around the world, generally you find the most accurate we can get is what we call two to three times the GSD. So whatever your distance is per pixel, times that are probably three to be the safe side, and that's about how accurate you'll get in an ideal survey. So that means that if the real point here is X, Y, Z in space with a surveyor, one and a half GSD, three times that, about four and a half centimetres, so I'm probably plus or minus four and a half. Most um, clients will want you to be within about plus five, plus or minus five centimetres. That's kind of a very standard criteria across the industry. Um, some clients will need that much more accurate, which is where we need to look at LiDAR or other solutions. Um, general surveyors go out with the, you know, the surveying pole, they set up the station, walk around with the roam. It's probably about plus or minus two centimetres in reality, um, unless they set up a a more complicated um, setup. But, so we're about plus or minus five. Some people will get away with plus or minus 10, they're happy with that. So you just gotta adjust your survey accordingly, depending on what the client wants. Um, important to understand too that the internal GPS in these things, in most consumer um, RPA, really is probably plus or minus 10 to 15 meters in real world, okay? So where it is, where it thinks it is in space when we take off, probably within about 10 meters of that place in reality. If a surveyor was to go out and go, this is the X, Y, Z of this position. So it will be accurate internally to itself, but not compared to real world. So if you're going to do a survey and then you want to give that to, say, a mining client or surveyors who really want to use that data, that volumetric data, you need to look at putting out what we call ground control points. Okay, so that's essentially a mark on the ground. It can be like a box with a cross in the middle, um, usually about you know, two foot by two foot. Um, yeah, and basically you're going out, putting a surveying point on that point and registering what that is. And you add that information in post. So when you go to produce the model, you say, all right, I know that, 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 and that. These positions are here in real world. And the software then will bolt that model down to where it should be. Okay, so it'll be pretty accurate internally, but it'll be floating around within 10 meters of where it should be. The GCPs allow us to bolt it. What are you using to find that position of the spectrum? Yeah, sure. So sometimes you might use conventional surveying techniques, such as go out of the road. Okay, with, um, with a station, or what a, a great solution now is actually the Propel Aeroponics. So I don't know if you guys have seen those. No. They're actually like a, a foam pad, so I've used these a few times in the field, they're great. So they're like two boxes with a, a point in the middle, and essentially you throw them out, hit a button, within about 30 minutes to an hour they've already found that position, so they use a wireless network. Um, and so they find all those positions on site. Once you finish your survey, go back, pick them all up, and then that uploads the data straight to the propeller server and you can pull that out. So, a little bit easier if you don't have survey equipment. Um, survey equipment, you know, look, survey equipment for a second hand set is probably going to set you back eight to ten grand. Um, and you've got to go set that up in the field, get your station right, then walk around with the rover. It's quite time consuming. Um, whereas the propeller error point is still up around that mark, it's about six to eight thousand. But, save time in the field. You know, you can even get a set between a few guys and share them because you're probably not all flying every day, that sort of job. So that can be a good solution. Alternatively, you work with the client and say, hey, I've got the capability to produce the model. Do you have surveyors you work with or is it a surveyor? But they're happy to put the points out for you. So when I did local government work, they love actually being able to look at that themselves from their own um, peace of mind and also make sure, you know, with a QA point of view, quality assurance. So they go out, put points out, number it for me, send me a list. And uh, okay, that's what I'm finding when I go and do the model. Uh, we can chat a little bit more about that if you want more information, just have a chat to me. 